Hello, a very good evening. It's four minutes past nine on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. I want to talk about Cyprus in this hour of the programme because it's a, it's a country that many people in Britain have been on holiday to. A lot of people own property there. Um, but it, it's a country, if you haven't been there, I'm not sure that many of us know an awful lot about it. We, we, we sort of know that there's a split. We know that there's a split between the south and the north. But I wonder how many of us really understand the reasons for that. Um, there have been various initiatives over the years to try and either reunite the island or come up with a solution where there's two separate states. So at the moment, you've got the Republic of Cyprus, which is the southern bit, and then you've got northern Cyprus, which is effectively the, the, the Turkish bit of the island. Um, now, I could go into a long exposition about the history of Cyprus and how that's come to pass, but we've got two guests that are going to be with us um, over the course of the next half an hour, and then we're going to come to your call and after quarter past nine, I'm going to be talking to the uh, Cypriot High Commissioner to London. But first, I want to welcome um, Ersin Tatar to the studio. He's leader of the Turkish Cypriot community and president of uh, North Cyprus. Um, Ersin, thank you very much, or Mr. Uh, Mr. President, maybe I should say. Thank you very much for joining us in, in the studio. Now, um, North Cyprus is not recognised by any country in the world as a state apart from Turkey. Yes. It's not recognised by the United Nations. And given that the situation has existed since 1974, um, why should other nations recognise North Cyprus as a, as a separate if, entity? If, if, if you go back into history, uh, after the Ottoman times, the British leased the island, and then after the First World War, uh, the British, according to us, annexed it, and then they lost an agreement. 1923, uh, it became under uh, British sovereign rule. During those times, uh, the Greeks, with their Eoka movement, were into gangs and uh, other attempts to unite Cyprus with Greece. And this was not allowed because uh, even Britain, United Kingdom, did at the same time, as it said, uh, here there exist two peoples, two communities, but in literature, peoples, because you've got the Turks who are Turkish, Islam, different culture, different history, different experience, and the Greeks. And the 1960 Republic of Cyprus, of which the United Kingdom is a guarantor power, it does say explicitly in there yeah. that f o o from Cyprus you have two peoples. One is Turkish sovereign people, the other one Greek sovereign people. So Greeks are not more sovereign than the Turks. Therefore, uh, since but the there 90s, are more of them. Or could be, but we have more, more living outside of Cyprus. Uh, we have more uh, Turkish people living in Anatolia uh, than in Cyprus. We have probably as many here in the UK and other places. And therefore, as a people, uh, regardless of the population, we are as sovereign as Greek Cypriots. Therefore, we are co-founders of the Republic of Cyprus. And as a distinct people, we deserve to have our own uh, self-determination. This is the international uh, parameter, that if you are a people, you should have a say of your future. But and in the Annan plan, we did say yes to this comprehensive... Th this was in 2004, the yes, Annan we plan, did say yes. Co Kofi Annan. Yeah. You, your community said yes, and the yeah. Greek Cypriots said no. no. And we were promised that if we said yes to this plan, then all the embargoes and isolations would be lifted, so that the Turkish Cypriots would be more comfortable with their economy and all the rest of it. But unfortunately, uh, they said no. And having said no, they were rewarded by being into Europe without even consulting neither the Turkish Cypriots, co-founders of the Republic of Cyprus, nor the guarantor power Turkey. Therefore, it's tilted against us with the European bloc behind them. Therefore, now the new policy, we have our own sovereignty. We have had a different state, separate state for the last 60 years. Since December 1963, Turkish Cypriots have had their own state, Greek Cypriots, with the Republic of Cyprus on their but, own. But it's not recognized by anybody else apart from see, Turkey. Turkish, That's the point. T t Turkish recognition is very important because through Turkey, we have been able to survive with independence, with our honor, with our dignity. Otherwise, for the last 60 years, there have been a lot of attempts. In fact, according to one former Greek Cypriot foreign minister, 15 different United Nations proposals have all been rejected by the Greek Cypriots because their whole aim was to make the Turkish Cypriots a minority. We will never accept to be a minority because... But numerically, we are, we are, I mean, we are, factually and numerically, look, you are a minority. Look at Greek Cypriots. They are in Europe. They have a veto power. 
against all the others. With, an, with less than a pop, one million population, he stands next to Germany, Italy as an independent state. They are in my own country, just because um, the numbers have been uh, such uh, generated that they've, they've got a few hundred thousand more, that doesn't mean that uh, sovereignty-wise I should be uh, humiliated. But My sovereignty no, I, is no, as I, important I, I can, as theirs. I can, I can see that, but the fact is that Turkey invaded northern Cyprus. No, it in intervened to protect the Turkish people. It, 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 no, no, no. Because, because it, it Turkey invaded. was a guarantor power. It invaded. It ga- and there are military power. forces Gar- there. No, no, no. no. Garantor, we called Turkey because we would have gone through another genocide. We did go through genocide in the 1960s, as did the British with the Eoka movement. They killed a lot of British soldiers to unite Cyprus to Greece. And uh, you were in a lot of trouble. But then the Republic of Cyprus, they thought was the solution because it would have been a stable environment, coexistence together. But unfortunately, it only lasted for three years because Makarios did say the same. This is just a stepping stone to analysis. Okay. All they had in mind, United Cyprus to Greece. Therefore, the Turks had to be protected. And the motherland, Turkey, because of her unilateral intervention right as a guarantor power, moved in to protect the Turkish Cypriots. Uh, well, I'm sure I'm sure the Cypriot High Commissioner will have a different view to that when I speak to him a bit later. He, he, but, might, I mean, he might, he might, but this is... A, this is you're, you're kind of splitting hairs on sort well, of the, the, the terms here, this, aren't this, you? This is a very fundamental issue for Turkish Cypriots. Our security, our well-being, and our existence is very important. That's why we say coexistence. I, I've read an two article... States, two states uh, next to each other. I've, I've read an article that you've written for the CAPEX website today, mm. um, which is full of invective against the Greeks, but not there isn't a lot in it that shows the way forward, apart from saying that there should be a two-state solution. Um, it strikes me that, they, that, I mean, not a couple of hundred miles uh, to the east of Cyprus is Israel, where if, if when I have conversations with the Palestinian ambassador or the Israeli ambassador, it seems to me as if it's a very similar conversation here, where neither side seems to be willing to understand the arguments of the other side. Well, you see, my uh, feeling is that the Greek Cypriots uh, know the problem. Uh, Turkish Cypriots are a different people, they are a different people, Reciprocity dictates that we should uh, respect each other. Since we have had our own state for the last 60 years, and they have got their own republic down in the south for the last 60 years, let's get together, neighbor relationship. So I am offering two states cooperating together in terms of economy, in terms of environment, in terms of energy. We have brought in water from Turkey, which is a major project, billion dollars worth of investment. We can share the water together. We can do all sorts of things together. And uh, given, given the new technology and the new... Uh, do you think a one-state solution is dead? Because if I... I mean, OK, it's difficult for me to put myself in the position of a Cypriot, whether it's Turkish or, or Greek. But if I was a Cypriot, I think I would want my island to be united. It's a bit like in Ireland. A lot of people want the but island see, of Ireland to be have, united. We have had a very bitter experience in the past. We have suffered a lot. In 1960, we had this vision also, but it didn't last for very long because of their ambition to unite with Greece, national pride. Uh, this morning... Uh, but that's not going to happen now. No, no one's suggesting that, are So they? basically, we have had our own state for the last 60 years. There's no going back. Let's cooperate. Let's cooperate in a very... Uh, in a democratic way so that we can work for our people, we can coexist. If we can coexist, it will be a win-win situation. Uh, Cyprus can be twice as big as Dubai, believe you me, because Greek Cypriots, I respect them, they are uh, entrepreneurs, they are very able people, uh, so are the Turkish Cypriots. So get together. So, so, so let's work out a practical solution. It's got to be practical, it's got to be sustainable, it's got to be workable, and, and it's, got to be, also, it's got to be realistic. For you, it's got to be sellable to your voters in Northern Cyprus, in that you, you might person. I mean, I'm not so, put, trying to put words into your mouth here, but you might personally think, well, yeah, I would quite like to have a one-state solution, but I don't think I'll be able to sell that to my people. Well, basically, our people are very concerned about their security because we have had sacrificed a lot. We have gone through, in a way, I don't want to say it, but genocide. Therefore, we don't want to go back all those times. What we want is our security and our uh, confidence that we can exist uh, with our own sovereignty. That's why we say two sovereign equal states cooperating together for the well-being of all Cypriots. And obviously, Cyprus is a regional balance between uh, Turkey, Turkey, and Greece. Uh, that's very important. 
Uh, now that Europe is in Europe, and if there is a federal agreement, as they always thought should be, Cyprus will be wholly in Europe, because Turkey, Turkey is not in Europe, Turkey will be out, and they are, they are asking that after a settlement, Turkey will have to pull out, Turkey will go, and Turkish guarantee will be expired. This is unfair on Turkey, because we are always uh, together with Turkey. Turkey is our motherland, and Turkey has done a well, lot. Just, the just on that, I mean, you have been accused of being President Erdogan's puppet. Well, I mean... Well, I don't uh, say that as an insult, but that is, <laughs> that is an accusation that people have made. Ha t give me one occasion where you've disagreed with him. Well, basically, my policy is that I should be in full conformity with Turkey, because Turkey is a big power, uh, a, a substantial aid, economic aid. But that's like Ukraine saying that we should be in support. full accord with Russia. I mean, it doesn't work, does it? Well, we, if, we, if you want to be an independent uh, nation... Well, our our, our, our uh, relationship with Turkey, as far as we are concerned, is so significant that we, in all aspects of life, we try to cooperate with motherland Turkey, because motherland Turkey has always sacrificed a lot uh, for the Turkish Cypriots. Uh, they, they've uh, lost a lot because they supported Turkey, the Turkish Cypriots, uh, troops were in Cyprus, they, all over the place, but they always have been with the Turkish Cypriots because they believed in us, they believed in our security, and uh, basically our uh, relationship is constructive because we are important for Turkish security. Turkey is only 40 miles away from Turkey. So near, when you wake up in the morning in Karenia, you can see the mountains of Turkey, and when they've had this uh, earthquake, on the 6th of February, we felt it in Cyprus, so near. Uh, therefore, a lot yeah. of uh, dimensions to the Cyprus problem, and Turkey, our motherland, is of critical essence. Just, just finally, how optimistic are you that if we were sitting here in 10 years' time, assuming that both of us are still here in 10 yeah. years' time, are you optimistic that, there, that we will be either nearer some sort of agreed diplomatic solution between the Republic of Cyprus and Northern Cyprus, or do you, do you fear that the, the status quo that has existed for so long will still be there? I want the international community, and especially the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is a guarantor power, has got responsibilities, and the British know the problem in Cyprus much better than... Well, would you else. like Britain to take a diplomatic initiative in, on this? It, it, yes, it should twist the arm of the Greek Cypriots a little bit more to come nearer to a practical solution. I will repeat again, for a solution in Cyprus, you need to be practical, it's got to be fair, it's got to be sustainable. You don't want an agreement in Cyprus which will lead to internal conflict again, because that will be damaging. Uh, we have had peace on the island for the last nearly 50 years after the Turkish intervention, and this peace is very valuable, not only for the Turkish Cypriots, also for the Greek Cypriots. They have had their economy prosper. Why? Because there is peace on the island, stability on the island. Why the Turkish troops have been the insurance policy for peace and security and for stability. Therefore, we have to develop, devise a solution forward so that we can coexist. Okay. And since we have had two different states on the island, I am offering my uh, Greek friends, and I uh, respect their ability, I respect their entrepreneurship, and I want to coexist. But the only way to coexist in the future, after all these experiences, two states side by side in good relationship for both Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, because once we have a solution, it will be a win-win situation. Okay. Turkish Republic, for example, at the moment doesn't recognize the Greek Cypriot Republic down in the south. When we have an agreement, Turkish ports will be open to the Greek we, Cypriots. We, Turkish airspace will have be to open. Leave it there, I'm afraid, so you see, I'm... it's a win-win situation. It will be for the benefit of all Cypriots. So I propose and I beg them to reconsider their approach to the Cyprus problem and to respect the reality on well, the island. I have to give equal time to <laughs> our next guest, so yeah. I've got to leave it there. Thank, Thank you. you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you very much. It's yeah. very Thank nice you, to yeah. meet Thank you. you yeah. uh, we've already got lots of calls on the board. If you'd like to uh, phone in with your views on the, the Cypriot situation after half past nine, uh, you can do so right now on 0345 6060 973. It's 18 minutes past nine. LBC.
Uh, 21 minutes past nine. Well, you've heard from the Turkish Cypriot side of the argument. Now we're going to hear from the Greek Cypriot side. Uh, Andreas Kakaris joins me, uh, the Republic of Cyprus's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. What a great job title that is. Uh, Andreas, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Um, to, to the outsider, to people who know nothing about this uh, th- this whole issue, it does seem ludicrous that an island with a population of uh, about 1.3 million is split into two. What would you like to see happen now? Well, firstly, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be uh, with you this evening. Um, look, I think it, it's important to, to put the situation to a, into a context Uh, The island is split because of a continuing Turkish uh, occupation. And as you correctly correctly referred to it as an invasion back in 1974, our effort, uh, the effort of the government of the Republic of Cyprus, the effort uh, of uh, the president, uh, President Kostolidis, is to get back to the negotiating table, to find a solution that reunites the island, the people's social fabric within the established framework of a bizonal, bicommunal federation with a single sovereignty, single international personality, and a single citizenship, and with political equality as defined in UN Security Council resolutions. But, that is the framework. But what wasn't wasn't that exactly what was proposed in the Kofi Annan report in 2004, which uh, Turkish Cypriots voted in a referendum to accept, but Greek Cypriots didn't? Well, you're right that Turkish Cypriots voted in favour and Greek Cypriots uh, did not. And I think you would need to ask yourself the question, why did the Greek Cypriots overwhelmingly uh, vote not to accept the Annan plan? Uh, You have the community that has lost the most by being under occupation. Why would they not want to vote in favour of a solution? It's because the Annan plan did not solve the Cyprus problem. It did not deal with fundamental issues such as the withdrawal of Turkish troops, uh, the right of intervention that Turkey claims it has. So there were fundamental issues that were not dealt with at that time. And that is uh, amongst the main reasons why the Annan plan did not go forward. But there has not been the end of the efforts for a solution. Those have continued since then. And what has changed is the position of the Turkish side, which Mr. Tatar uh, quite eloquently set out, is what they want is two states. That is outside of the framework that has been agreed by both communities, but also by the international community and as referenced in countless UN Security Council resolutions. So the change in the efforts for a solution have come from the Turkish side that no longer wants to work towards reuniting the island, the people and the social fabric, but want to use the the, the, the spoils of war uh, that might is right to have two states on the island. And that's something that uh, we, won't, uh, we won't accept. And that is something that the international community has been very clear on too. Is it, I mean, I, I said this to Mr. Tatar, though, is this something where you would welcome a British diplomatic initiative to at least scope out what might be possible, not to have maybe formal negotiations, because I'm not sure that either side would, would necessarily agree on, on at the moment on what should be negotiated on. But it is now the time, I and mean, we had the, as we said, the Annan uh, initiative in 2004. There, be, there have been other initiatives since then, but none of which have come to anything. Do you think now is the time, maybe for Britain, to take a diplomatic initiative? Look, the United Kingdom is, is an important uh, player uh, in the efforts uh, for a solution to the Cyprus problem. It's a guarantor power. It's a P5 member of the Security Council. The efforts for a solution are under the aegis of uh, the UN uh, Secretary General's good offices as well. So that is where the framework uh, and the efforts for a solution uh, come from. The President, uh, President Christodoulidis, has been making a big push uh, since his election to get a greater engagement of the European Union uh, in the efforts for a solution. That is what we're uh, doing at the time. Uh, efforts by countries to support a solution of the Cyprus problem based on that framework is something that is welcomed. But I think at this moment in time, what we're all uh, looking at is what's going to happen in the elections in Turkey uh, coming May. And hopefully 
uh, efforts for to, to get back to the table to find a solution can restart. There have been efforts, uh, many efforts after 2004. Transmontana in 2017 was the last big effort, and we want to get back to the negotiating table and move from where we left off at Transmontana in 2017. What, what is the relationship like between uh, Mr. Tatar's administration and your government? I mean, because often you... you ha I mean, it's a bit... I, I hesitate to make the Israeli-Palestine com comparison because obviously it doesn't, it doesn't quite match. But, I mean, I know that the Israeli Prime Minister and, the, and um, other ministers in his government have lots of talks behind the scenes with the Palestinian Authority. I mean, presumably... There have to be talks, um, and I think over the last few years there have been a sort of, there has been a sort of lessening of tensions, as I think a couple more border crossings have been opened. But how, how deep do those contacts go? Uh, Ian, if, if I may, because language is is important. You just used the word border there. There are no borders. Inside. Well, there is a border. No, it's, it's not. A, a border. It's, it, border, well, it, it is because you've got UN troops policing it. Yeah, there is a ceasefire line and a buffer zone. Borders denote separate states. Uh, there isn't well, a separate state okay. in, in the occupied area. I think you're splitting hairs, to be fair. But, I mean, there, there, I mean, people can't freely cross whatever you want to call it. People, people do cross uh, the buffer zone, but I think we need to respect international law, which has declared that the entity in the Turkish occupied part of Cyprus is not recognised, and you correctly pointed uh, that out. And Mr Tatar who claims to be the president of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, that doesn't exist as an international legal entity, which the Security Council declared illegal, null and void. There are the efforts to get back to the table will be between, uh, to get Mr. Tatar's lead of the Turkish Cypriot community, back to the table with President Christodou Lidis, who's also lead of the Greek Cypriot community, to move forward yeah, on some... Fine. But you haven't quite answered my question. Do the two of them talk on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis? The, the president, when he was elected, but before he took over, sought to meet Mr. Tala, uh, Mr. Tatar, uh, which he did in the presence of the UN representative in Cyprus. So that was his outreach even before taking office to impress upon Mr. Tatar that the situation in Cyprus cannot continue as it is. We cannot have a situation uh, nearly 50 years on uh, of a divided island, a divided people. Uh, Greek and Turkish Cypriots are Cypriots. Uh, they are Cypriot people, whether of Greek uh, origin or Turkish origin, but there is a Cypriot whether he is Greek, Turkish, Maronite, or Armenian. And I take exception to what Mr. Tatar said, that that does not exist. If you go down to parts of London, Greek and Turkish Cypriots uh, have uh, the green grocer next to the halal butcher. Uh, you wouldn't know which of the two is Greek or which of the two, or which of the other is, is Turkish. So there is a people, one people called the Cypriot people. And that is what we're trying to reunite again. And I would also just make this point, that the overwhelming majority of Turkish Cypriots have applied and received their Cypriot passports, their Cypriot ID cards, which allows a Turkish Cypriot today to study in France, to reside in Germany, or to work in Sweden, courtesy of the fact that they are Cypriot citizens, not because of a Turkish occupation, or so-called TRNC citizenship. I, I, I hear what you say, but from my reading today to prepare for these interviews, um, I'm sure I've read that it's actually, it's quite cumbersome, quite difficult for Turkish Cypriots to get all of this documentation. Could you not make that process a little easier? I have Turkish Cypriots that come to the High Commission here in London to apply for their passports and their ID cards, and they get them in exactly the same way. As a, as a Greek Cypriot does, or an Armenian Cypriot does, or a Maronite Cypriot does. And they get those, those same documentations uh, in Cyprus too, as long as they can prove that they are of Cypriot origin. Let, let me finish by asking you the same question that I asked to Mr Tata. If we're sitting here in 10 years' time, are you optimistic 
that things will have changed, that there will be better <clears throat> relations, that there could be a unitary state? Or do you think we're just going to go through all of this over the next few years, time after time, and nothing will change? Ian, if we were sitting uh, opposite each other 25, 30 years ago, and you Unlikely in my case. To, <laughs> I'd said to you that apartheid would have ended in South Africa, the Berlin Wall would have remain, come yeah. down in Germany, or there would have been a peace process in Northern Ireland. I think we would have smiled at each other. But it happened, and it can happen. What we need to be able to move forward is to get a Turkish side that is willing to sit at the table to find a solution that reunites the island, the people on the island of Cyprus, okay, to have a common future together as a country that's a member of the European Union as well. And I think there is a bright future if we can go down that path. But to go down that path, I need Turkey to recognize that the notion of might is right. It's not the one that's gonna lead us to a solution. We're prepared to do everything we can to get a solution, to get to the negotiating table as soon as we can. Hi, Commissioner, thank you very much indeed for joining us on LBC. That's Andreas Kakoris, who is the High Commissioner for the Republic of Cyprus. Well, we're going to come to your calls in a moment. Um, do you see a way forward? What would you like to see happen now? Particularly keen to hear from you. Obviously, if you are from the Greek Cypriot community or the Turkish Cypriot community in the UK, or I know we have listeners in Cyprus too. It's 9.33, news headlines with Daryl Jackson. The Immigration Minister has upset some MPs in his own party with his idea to have house thousands of asylum seekers in military bases. It's to cut the amount of money being spent on hotels. The Vatican says Pope Francis needs to spend a few days in hospital for treatment for a respiratory infection. A six-year-old has complained. in Berlin this evening. It's part of the first state visit of the new monarch's reign. LBC weather, heavy outbreaks of rain across western and southern areas tonight. A breezy and rather mild night with lows of five. This is LBC.
text, uh, Rishi from Longhurst has a fascinating conversation on something I'm ashamed to say I knew nothing about. Well, you're not alone in that, Rishi. You shouldn't be ashamed because nobody can keep across every every different cl- conflict zone in the world. But I do think this does have a particular resonance for Britain, given uh, the fact that Britain used to rule Cyprus and given the fact that we still have military bases there. Um, right, let's go to your calls. Interested to hear what you made of those two interviews and what you think the future for Cyprus should be. Uh, and if you are from the Greek side of the argument, do you actually understand the case that the Turkish side is making and vice versa? Hassan is in Chesant. Hello, Hassan. Hi, Ian. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. What would you like to say? I'm from a Cypriot Turkish background myself, so I wanted to just uh, kind of put it across from our perspective, I guess. I mean, whilst everyone agrees on what the historical causes are, you'll notice that obviously where the narrative begins from uh, is different on both sides uh, because both communities were affected in different ways. So (laughs) at the end of the day, I think that the Cypriots in and of themselves, although there are common Cypriot customs and uh, commonality in culture and and things of of this nature, the, the reality is in and of ourselves, we don't really have power over the geopolitical situation. It's Turkey, Greece, and, and the UK, basically, and it's heavily kind of rooted in geopolitics. So the realistic answer would be mutual recognition. So for Turkey to recognize the the ROC and for the North and the South to recognize each other as separate independent states, although that would look, obviously, at first glance, quite awkward because of how small the island is, uh, I could see a stalemate going on for another 50 years if it stays as it is. Mm. Which for Cypriot, in your, in your heart, not being recognised and being isolated. So, forget the geopolitics of all of this. In your heart, <laughs> would you like to see one Cyprus? That would be an ideal situation, yeah. That would be an ideal solution, but it's I just can't uh, see that as realistic or rooted in reality. The gentleman earlier, for example, uh, the argument over the border, the reality is the ROC, Republic of Cyprus, has no sovereignty in the north. It exercises no control. So that is the reality well, of the situation. Well, that, that, those are two different things. It does actually have yeah. sovereignty over the north, but it doesn't have any control. It doesn't have any executive authority in, in reality, no. uh, whether on paper or not. But the reality is, I just can't see uh, them breaking the deadlock because... <laughs> They tried a unitary state solution, then they tried a federation kind of based on the the Swiss model with uh, the Kofi Annan plan, which I think was actually a workable plan. It was a workable but, plan. But, but, but the high again, commissioner there, he, I mean, he when when he first started talking about this, he seemed to be wanting to resurrect that and saying that 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 could be the basis for a solution. But then said he wouldn't accept two separate states. So I was slightly confused by that. Um, the thing is, it would fail on the same issue that it failed on last time, which is the security issue uh, on how many troops should remain. Because uh, I think from the Cypriot Turkish perspective, being a minority, there's more concern about uh, discrimination or security based on things that happened in the past. I think under British rule, the Cypriot Turks were not discriminated against in any way. Whereas <clears throat> we felt that because at the, at the time it was slightly different, there was a the whole uniting with Greece thing, which was slightly different. But this is, as for Cypriots in and of themselves governing themselves, that could work. But it's a matter of Turkey and Greece solving their differences. It's always been the case. Yeah. Which and, and I, guess, I guess I guess from the. Greek point of view. I mean, if there was a united Cyprus, it would be one country and therefore it would be unacceptable to have Turkish troops stationed on the island. So if there, if there was, if there were military concerns, maybe there there would have to be some sort of British peacekeeping force or, I mean, I'm not even sure peacekeeping force is the right expression, but I, I, I can see from their point of view, why, why on earth would they accept Turkish soldiers on Cypriot soil? They wouldn't and at the end of the day, that's that comes down to the whole sovereignty issue and versus security or, or minority rights. That's where the the whole thing fell apart the last time. Mm. Um, well, you know, both, both communities you, uh, had, had bad experiences. So, 
Hassan, if you and I were involved in the negotiations, I suspect that they might get a bit further than they have so far, but there we are. Um, Aisha says, uh, why was the High Commissioner allowed to respond to President Tartar's views, but President Tartar not allowed the same? Well, it's for a very simple reason, because one had to go before the other. And as it was, um, as in Tartar's people who offered the interview, we thought we'd go first with him. There's no agenda on my part here, I can assure you. Let's go to uh, Adrian, who's a first-time caller in Barnet. Hello, Adrian. Good evening. Hi, what would you like to say? Well, Ian, uh, thanks for, you know, bringing this to people's attention. I don't think many people in the UK are aware of what's happened in Cyprus. And as you said at the beginning of the programme, go then holiday and don't really know that uh, there's an illegal occupation that's ongoing. Uh, so thank you initially for that. Um, and I just wanted to take a step back and rewind back to 1974. And the one thing to take uh, take into consideration and, and to always remember is that there was an illegal invasion. And if we would never accept the illegal invasion of Russia in Ukraine, and I don't think LBC or anyone in the UK would give a platform to the so-called president of Crimea or other regions that have illegally claimed their so-called independence through the illegal invasion of Russia. Why on earth are we even entertaining uh, a two-state solution that would legitimize an illegal invasion, an illegal occupation that has been ongoing for such a long time because Turkey is not willing to own up to the atrocities it carried out and its illegal methods of imposing itself on separate people. Well, I thought you were going to say, why on earth would we have had um, the, the Sintata on the programme at all in that case, which um, I, I was about to marshal my arguments as to why it was a, a perfectly reasonable thing to do. <coughs> I think the honest answer is that because this has been going on for 50 years now, if you just want to accept the status quo forever and a day, fine, then don't even talk about these things. But given that it is, um, well, well it, it is actually 49 years, isn't it? So it's, it's nearly, 50, nearly half a century. I think it is probably, this is probably a good time, given that there has been no diplomatic initiative since 2017, for something to start and it has to start somewhere I'm, I'm not grandiosely saying that we can start it by having this conversation tonight but at least it brings it to people's attention well look as i said it's, i think it's, it's fantastic that lbc has brought this to people's attention but the one the one distinguished argument i, I like to make as as a representative of a youth organization a youth organization that has greek separate members turkish separate members armenian separate members maronite separate members and the, who all who come to the events, and we all get along. And the difference between the youth and Ersin Tatar or other people of that generation is that we look forward. And looking forward, we want one Cyprus. We want to peacefully coexist. We understand that the past has caused pain, and we don't want to relive that. But, of course, some might be Greek, some might be Christian, some might be, speak Turkish, some might be Muslim. However, we have something in common, and that's, Cyprus and the fact that we are Cypriots and of course we can peacefully coexist and of course we can live in one Cyprus and most Cypriots don't want a division they would never accept that so if we want to be in touch with reality with international law with justice we could never accept an illegal invasion an illegal occupation okay. no, and, and the way we react to Russia and what it's done in Ukraine is really how we should be reacting to Turkey and what it's done in Cyprus. There's no difference. It's been by force, it's been by legal means, and it's really unacceptable. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. And look, I was only 11 years old in 1974, so I, I, I imagine there was a huge international outcry. Um, can you just, I'm going to read a text here, but maybe you can answer the question. It's from Tay. He says, I'm half Turkish Cypriot. The Republic of Cyprus rejected the Annan plan because they wanted Turkish troops to leave Cyprus, but not Greek troops. The Turkish people do not want to be under a Greek state that pretends to be a Cypriot state. After almost 15 years of intercommunal communal uh, 
uh, violence. It's like asking Ireland to be back under British rule. The only way this is possible is if the next generation remove the historical grudges. Well, I think that last sentence is very important here. Um, but, I mean, obviously, I don't know how old you are, Adrian, but is the... The, was the reason for the Greek Cypriots rejecting the Annan report because it it, it would have um, it would have meant uh, that Greek troops would have had to leave Cyprus. No, yeah, and that's never been the problem. And if you look at the arrangement from the 1960s, uh, 1960 constitution, and uh, the agreements, then we're talking about a few hundred. Greek troops, which is constitutional. They, they are meant to be there, just like Turkey could have a few hundreds according to the agreement back in 1960. We're not talking about 40,000 soldiers that Turkey illegally has on the island. There's a huge difference. I am sure that any Greek separate would say that at any given moment, if Turkey says today we're willing to take our 40,000 uh, soldiers off the island, they would very much support if, if the few hundred Greek soldiers leave as well. Of course, we would accept that. Of course, we would. We, you okay. know, comparing, right. comparing an apple to a pear is not really helpful. All right. And the, 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 one thing uh, I, you know, the one thing I would, I would just add to that argument is that um, just like the Turkish separate community demand that we respect their concerns about security, they equally need to put that thought about us. It's not normal to expect any Greek Cypriot to feel safe with 40,000 Turkish soldiers remaining on the island after what happened in 1974. Okay, we fine. Adrian, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Metin in London says, Turkey did not illegally invade in 1974. Fact, it was a peace operation sanctioned by guarantor powers. Let's get our facts correct. Greece invaded Cyprus in 1974, which started the war in the first place. I think that is, shall we say a slight perversion of history, in fact, a major perversion. But, um, listen, I'm not the expert. If you want to take issue with that, give us a call. It's 9.40 to 8. Coming up at 10 on LBC, Ben Kentish. As technology leaders and experts call for an urgent halt to the development of artificial intelligence, are we at risk of blindly sleepwalking into oblivion? Ben Kentish on LBC.
51 on LBC. Uh, lots of you responding on text and tweets saying that had the Turkish, uh, had the Turks not invaded in 1974, there was a strong possibility of the Turkish Cypriots being ethnically cleansed. Well, again, I, I can't pass judgment on that, but um, I thought I'd throw that into the mix. Uh, Ken is in Edmonton. Hello, Ken. Hello, Ian. How are you? <clears throat> Very well, thank you. What would you like to say? Good. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, the, 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 it's quite often the, the Greek Cypriots try to say that it's the Cyprus situation started in 74. In fact, this is wrong. It started back in 1963 because in March 4th, 1964, the United Nations came to the island as a result of Greek Cypriot attacks on Turkish Cypriot community in Christmas 1963. And that the UN had been here since March 1964. So let's get that straight. The second thing is I, I want to say, on the 15th of July 1974, Greece instigated a coup on the island and overthrew the elected Archbishop Makarios of the island. There was five days of bloodshed between the Greeks themselves. And on the 19th of July 1974, Makarios, the dethroned president, went to the United Nations and said, Greece, this is an invasion of the island by Greece. And it, and it called for help to stop this invasion. And this is, this is, these are facts. These are easily be checked. If anyone bothered to look on Google and check it out. Makarios' speech to the United Nations Security Council on the 19th of July, 1974. Okay, listen. Ken, hang, hang on a second. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the history lesson, but what we're really asking is what's the future going to be? The future, well, the negotiations have been going on since 1968, not, not from 74. There have been 17 possible solutions that the Greek Cypriots have rejected, and this is according to Nikos Rolandis, former Greek Cypriot foreign minister. This can be checked as well. 17 have been rejected by them. Okay, but what, what about the future? The future is obviously we've, we've, we've negotiated for nearly 50 years for federation. It's not worked. Things have to change. The only solution now is a two state solution. There cannot be anything else because we've tried one route. It's stupid to keep trying the same solution when you know for the last 50 odd years it's not worked. It's time to get a change, a different tact, a different solution. And the best solution, it seems to be, to stop the squabbling between the two court communities and prevent further wars and bloodshed is a two-state solution with the present borders being in situ. OK, Ken, thank you very much. Let's go to Aaron, who is in Boreham Wood. Hello, Aaron. Hi there, Ian. Thank you for having me on, especially for this very important subject. As you know, there's a large Cypriot community in the UK, both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. So it's it's important for all of us. I just and, do, to... and do those two communities get on in the UK? Is there any friction there? Well, I think, well... Conveniently enough, President Erison Tatar had a talk today at King's College London, and there was a huge anti-Turkish racist rally preventing him from trying to get into the building. So even though there obviously are examples of Greeks and Turks getting on absolutely well, we can't deny that there is hatred that still exists, especially amongst the youth. Uh, even in South Cyprus, you can see that it is the fascist parties, their membership is made up of the Greek Cypriot youth. So this hatred and historical grudge is not going away. It still exists to this day. And therefore, I support Ken, who was just before me, and the president, as a two-state solution is the only viable and sustainable solution that, that is suitable for the island of Cyprus. But the Greek Cypriots won't entertain a two-state solution. So where do you go from there? Then the TRNC and President Erson Tatar have to pursue their own way forward. Uh, they have to follow the COSFO method, which isn't unilaterally um, 
recognised by the international community. It has to go their own way. And they've already began making strides. They're an observer member of the um, Organisation of Turkic States. They do meet with international um, international organisations and they are now beginning to meet with other states such as Azerbaijan, Pakistan. There are other countries that support the plight of the Turkish Cypriot people and their their pursuit for recognition and independence. It has only been in the last two years that they've really reached for this two-state solution. The Turkish Cypriots before that have fully been on board for a federal solution. And it was only 2017 at Crans Montana where the Greek Cypriot delegation walked away despite yeah, no, we've, we, we've, he- we've heard about that Erin, thank you, we've only got two minutes left so I want to balance it up uh, with Chrissy in Romford, hello Chrissy Hi Ian, thanks for taking my call Hi. and thank you very much for highlighting the issue um, I was 10 years old when the 74 invasion took place in Cyprus and I, I consequently made a refugee and moved to the UK I really, I'm really quite incensed at the propaganda that's been, um, um, you know, portrayed tonight in the program. In particular, Mr. Tartar's comments that, and the language that's been used, the phraseology that Turkey intervened to stop the Greek Cypriot government from making the Turkish Cypriots a minority. Which I challenged him on. And as you quite rightly pointed out, in fact, it's a fact that they were a minority by the sheer number, not because we were trying to make them a minority. They invaded a sovereign state and it, and Turkey illegally occupies 37% of Cyprus. That is the legal entity that is recognized by the international community. You can't dispute that. Do we need do we need to have a by you know uh, to have t- two communities? The two communities can live together, it's been proven. And all this propaganda about, you know, that there's hatred. That's absolute rubbish. You need to visit Cyprus to see how the youth coexist, you mm. know, with their counterparts. You know, you have to experience it. Another really Chrissy, important ta- point Chrissy, make, time, time has beaten us, I'm afraid. We've reached the end of the hour. It's one of those occasions where I wish we had another hour, but Ben Kentish wouldn't like that. So uh, we're going to have to finish it there. Chrissy, thank you very much indeed. And thanks to everyone for contributing to this hour and the rest of the programme. I'll be back tomorrow from 7. And tomorrow I'll be joined in the studio by Dr Sean Williams. You'll know her as a distinguished news broadcaster on your TV screens. But these days, she's a qualified psychologist working in the NHS. And she'll be taking your calls on mental wellbeing and dealing with trauma. Coming up at one on LBC, it's Richard Spur. But right now, here's Ben Kentish. Ian, thank you very much. Yes, good evening all. Coming up... The pace at which they've accrued capabilities has exceeded our expectations and we're worried about what this might mean looking ahead. Today, technology leaders and experts try once again to warn us of the massive risk that artificial intelligence poses, not just to our jobs, but to our very existence. Elon Musk and Apple CEO Steve Wozniak, among those calling for a complete pause on the development of AI until we've properly worked out the potentially catastrophic consequences. How worried do you think we should be about this? If you work in AI or you're in that world, do you think these leaders are right to be sounding this alarm? And if you're just like me, somebody who doesn't really get any of this, how scared are you? On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This 